Greetings everyone and welcome to today's webinar, part of the ongoing Schulich School of Business webinar series on shaping the post-pandemic world. My name is Preet Olive and I'm the Associate Dean of Research at Schulich. I'll be hosting the webinar and moderating the question and answer session. Dr. Madhok is Professor of Strategy and Scotiabank Professor in International Business and Entrepreneurship at Schulich. Fluent in numerous languages, Dr. Madhok is a prolific researcher focusing on strategic alliances and international business. He has won numerous awards for his research and has been identified as a top scholar in these fields worldwide. Today, Professor Madhok will share his perspectives on the impact of COVID on globalization of business. To you, Anup. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks to the organizers for uh, organizing this. I'll be talking on the issue of have we reached peak globalization? And I'll give you the answer up front as to what, where I'm getting to. In my opinion, we have reached peak hyper-globalization. That does not mean that we have reached peak globalization. Maybe what's coming next is a different kind of globalization. Because of its scope, I'll be touching on various issues that others have touched on in the past from stakeholders to global value chains. But I'm trying to take a, a sweeping perspective towards this. So I'll start off with some historical context. It's almost like where are we coming from, where we are, and where we are going next. I'll be talking about various factors with respect to globalization and deglobalization. Then what I'll do is I'll put it all together. And towards the end, I have a couple of uh, issues on where are we going next and some food for thought at the end. That's, that's the way I'm organizing. All right, so let's start with some historical context. Uh, the arc of globalization. Essentially, I use the term arc because this has been going on for quite a while. Now, when we talk about globalization, you know, the terms liberalization, deregulation, globalization, they all kind of go hand in hand. And it's not like we haven't seen this before. Uh, if you go a century ago, it was a global world, a global world which had relatively few rules on trade. Essentially, economies did what they wanted, but there was globalization of trade, globalization of uh, humans, which we, we don't have today in terms of labor. And then we ended up hitting the Great Depression. And after the Great Depression, the world turned a little bit more domestic, beggar thy neighbor policies, for example, which is look after yourselves first, put tariffs, uh, protectionism, and well, in a way, deglobalization. And then we get to the post-war era. In the post-war era till about 1980, uh, there was a lot of reconstruction of the well, post-World War reconstruction. That's where the welfare state came in, the New Deal, uh, new global institutions that till today govern what we do, the World Bank, IMF, and so on and an increasing role of the state, not just in terms of welfare state, but uh, uh, state-led capitalism, industrial policy, the rise of Japan and so on. So that lasted 35 years. And then we get to around 1980. And so post 1980, we come to this era, which can be considered an era leading to hyper-globalization. And, and, and the historical context to that is Around the 70s, the Chicago School of Economics, essentially in of Chicago, became quite influential. There was the work of Milton Friedman, who talks about the business of business being simply business. And then there were uh, other theorists from there who were the fathers of shareholder capitalism. So this is in the 70s. And then in the 80s, I use the term the Thatcher-Reagan duo. They were two of a kind. They were leading nations of the world at that time, uh, economically. And their point of view kind of, they liked this. They were sympathetic towards the Chicago School. The third issue is around this time is the rise of the Asian tigers, the export-led economies uh, from East Asia. And simultaneously, the stagnation of Latin America. Well, one was liberalized export promotion policies that led them to become fairly developed states. And the other was the old school protectionism import substitution, and it ended up basically stasis. And the fourth issue is around that time, 
and I, I've put down here the Washington Consensus Rules with a question, with a, an exclamation mark. The, the word rules can be a, no, a noun and it can be a verb. But when I put an exclamation mark, I'm referring, it, uh, referring to a verb in a way where this is the World Bank being in Washington, the IMF being in Washington, the White House being in Washington. All this is basically talking about a conservative policy after 10 years of well, Chicago School, Thatcher, Reagan, and so on, where you free the market. And the domination of Washington, especially after the fall of the Soviet Union, essentially become a unipolar world. And this shapes the agenda for the years to come after that, till arguably post-2008 financial crisis, questions start being asked whether this is the way we want to go. So that's your the general arc of history. So we are into, now COVID comes in. So essentially what we have, if you look at it just this century, you have three what I call seismic events in the last two decades. One is the admission of China to the WTO in 2001. And this was momentous because China was becoming more visible, but there was this belief that if you accept China into the WTO, it becomes part of the committee of nations. They start following the rules of the game as set by the you know, WTO, international institutions. Slowly, they will become more like us, uh, whatever that's supposed to mean, but essentially trying to wean China off its old ways and admit them into the, well, the norms. That's China. But I put it as a seismic event because after they joined the WTO, well, all the manufacturing began shifting to China. In 2008 is the financial crisis. And I guess we don't need to talk about it, about it here. We all know that uh, it was uh, well, devastation in a way. The, and the third issue is today, COVID. And arguably, if you're saying the trajectory, if it was going towards hyper-globalization post-China being admitted to WTO, COVID becomes a tipping point where suddenly questions are being asked whether, whether this is the way we want to go. Let me talk about a few factors here that's leading to globalization and pressures against it. So essentially we've got, thanks to the Chicago School, the ascent of shareholder capitalism. And this is again, the Washington consensus, let the financial markets do what they, what they do, right? Then we've got technological advancements that happened over the last 20, 30 years, which enable global value chains. And what that means is instead of doing some outsourcing domestically, you can offshore to well, far away, and that far away meant China, and therefore China's emergence as the world's factory. And what does COVID show us? So with shareholder capitalism, we've got efficiency, productivity, just-in-time manufacturing, it's all about profits. The logic being the profits will come home, and then the home country, United States, benefits. But what COVID has shown, is you're only as strong as your weakest link. What you need is resilience, you need robustness, you need slack, but that goes against profitability. That goes against, well, I don't know whether it goes against shareholder value or not, but it goes against shareholder value of the hyper-globalization guy. The other issue is, again, we want to be so dependent on China. So instead of centralized production, more and more what we'll be having is distributed assets. If it may not come back home, it might go elsewhere, but it won't be centralized in one place. Then consider social factors. And social factors basically is saying globalization or hyper-globalization gives precedence to economy over society. So if you take the law of comparative advantage, that's what it's following. It's saying capital will go wherever labor might be cheapest, for example, as a factor of production. So here capital goes to China as it should do going by the laws of economics, but then it doesn't care about societal factors. So you have the hollowing out of production domestically. And as a result, you've got erosion uh, of local communities and society, they just become more fragile. And post COVID what's happening is it's staring at you in the face that communities are devastated. They can't handle it. And that's what I said earlier, you're only as strong as the, weakest link in the chain. Think about it, you can spend the best medical on medical facilities and you don't have any money or you haven't organized for masks and you and basically you're at the mercy of China, right? For, for instance, so you're only as strong as the weakest link in the chain. 
political factors. Essentially, I've put geopolitics and geoeconomics because they go hand in hand. But China is seriously the first global rival to the United States in multiple arenas, economic, political, and security. Basically, you had Japan in the 80s, but it was an economic threat. It wasn't a security or political threat. Part with, and security, especially because the constitution was written by the United States for them, and they couldn't do much about security. Russia was a security threat, but economically, it was, it, it was nothing. So China becomes, well, both an economic and now a political and, and a security threat. As a result, the uh, feeling when they join the WTO that uh, they will become more like us and follow global norms, now suddenly there's alarm that hey, this is really not the way we wanted it to go. So from a deeper intertwining of economies, you've got a decoupling. And what that basically means is, well, let's decouple by definition. So your Trump is talking about tariffs, you know, Huawei, Let's not uh, get on to the Chinese stand. The 5G is being led by Huawei. That's one of the issues. Also, you know, technology becomes a security issue and so on. And 5Eyes is the intelligence program by five of the Anglo-Saxon nations, basically trying to keep China out, among, among other things. And the third issue is nationalism and populism. As communities are getting devastated, countries are turning inward, not just in the United States, but in, uh, in Europe and so on. As a result, post-COVID, what's happening? Well, you've got from a unipolar world, you've got, you're now coming to a bipolar world. China's emergence is a superpower. But the other issue is, uh, think about it, COVID is only starting. It hasn't really taken over Africa. It hasn't really taken over many of the developing countries. As it starts taking over there, there might be a refugee crisis. If there's a refugee crisis, again, that exacerbates nationalism. All this is going to start happening over the well, foreseeable future technological factors. And technological factors, they basically underpinned global value chains. But now further technological advancements enable the reverse in, in various ways. One is, you know, capital labor substitution, for example, robotics and so on, increasing productivity domestically. Uh, so you no longer need to do to offshore it to China to the same extent. With uh, greater technological intensity, labor costs are becoming an increasingly small portion of the value added. Increasing labor costs in China and reducing its attractiveness. But there are other issues. For certain goods, the cost economics of uh, 3D printing, for example, might make it viable to be doing it uh, domestically. So for various reasons, that's impacting the extent of globalization. Then you have governance factors. And governance factors basically, I'm talking about global governance here. Well, are governed by post-World War II institutions like World Bank, like uh, IMF, like WTO and its precursor was GATT. They're not reflective of today's world. This was done post-World War II by the, the victorious uh, nations. Five of them, or, or, you know, five or a few more sat down and they designed the rules of the game. And now with the emerging world accounting for more and more of the global economy, and especially China, global rules of the game are increasingly being uh, questioned. It doesn't say China is not willing to play by the, by the rules of the game. The question is, who wrote the rules? If the rules were written by five countries, China has a legitimate uh, case to say, hey, I don't mind, but let's sit down together and rewrite the rules. And China and its model of state-led or authoritarian cap capitalism is a counterweight to uh, what we call liberal cap capitalism and is more and more attractive to, to many other countries uh, also. So the question becomes, do we have an evolution of the rules or do we have a bifurcation of institutions? That's an open question. For example, China's got the Asian investment Infrastructure Investment Bank, that's the counterpart of the World Bank. You know, what about the rules governing the internet? What about the rules governing 5G, the standards? These become uh, important issues. And finally, environmental factors. And, and, you know, the COVID crisis caught us off guard, the pandemic. Could climate crisis be the next pandemic? Because in one sense, it's saying, look, we are all one. We can't shut down the borders for certain kinds of things. Well, if climate crisis is the next pandemic, COVID might get us thinking about that a little bit. Uh, there's growing alarm about climate change. I won't, this is a bit of a, a digression. I won't really get into it, but environmental arbitrage may no longer be so uh, tenable. That's saying 
we've become more sensitive and therefore you can't go global shopping for the places where you can pollute the most. If there's more awareness that there might be pressure for a shorter logistics chain, uh, which deglobalization enables, and then there's less travel because of uh, video conferencing and so on. All right. So we've got various factors that are impacting what's going on right now. I want to put it all together. And I've got it broadly as the economy, the state, and the society, the great misalignment. And what this is saying is post-1990, at the when hyper-globalization began taking off, essentially the economy began getting a predominant emphasis. So economy, state, and society are three legs of a stool. And this over-obsessive focus on economic factors and economic financial factors have crowded out the other two factors. So going back to Reagan and Thatcher, Reagan famously said in 1981, the government is not the solution to our problem. The government is the problem. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, she said there is no such thing as society. Essentially what she meant to say is, uh, well, we are all individuals, we need to look after ourselves, we first look after ourselves, then we look after our family, we look after our neighbors, and so on and so forth. But you go to the government just as the last resort. So this kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy when there's no such thing as society. So essentially, the government gets the boot, society gets the boot, and you've got the economy reigning supreme. And now what's happening is arguably what can be called the grand correction. And this, you know, what COVID has shown, for example, the first thing you do is you run to the state to do something. So from less is better, it becomes the state as purposeful actor. For example, shock absorber through its various programs. The buffers that it provides is societal steward. How do we get out of this? Where do we want to go next? And so on. Suddenly countries have become appreciating that, you know, the state is not the problem. The state can also be an enabler. The society from, you know, when individuals got devastated, when uh, production became globalized, that was collateral damage. That's what the law of comparative advantage says. They don't talk about society, they talk about the economy. And now suddenly they've become essential stakeholders. And, and some of this stuff was post-financial crisis, essential stakeholders and not collateral damage. Uh, that sentiment has been um, accelerating. But I think COVID again, uh, like when I say tipping point is an inflection point, it just accelerates it even further. So the alignments that are happening, you know, between political and economics, so what we had in the past was a globalized economy and then a domestic polity, meaning, you know, your representation is domestic. What has started to happen is, you know, with this awareness of stakeholder responsibility, as well as Trump's tariff wars and so on. The economy is becoming less global and the domestic remains uh, global, so they start becoming aligned. The second one is between the economic and the social. It's no longer pure go-go shareholder capitalism, which benefits just a few at the top of the pyramid, the proverbial 1%, and uh, becoming a little bit more mindful of other stakeholders in society. The other issue is, uh, you know, instead of deregulation, deregulation, liberalization, privatization, these all go hand in hand to much more about society. So that's your, you're trying to get the three legs, the, the, the stool gets a little wobbly when one leg is much larger than the other two. So it's kind of trying to, uh, COVID might just push us more in the direction of greater alignment. Okay. So now this, this question of wither globalization, right? Where is it going? And in, in my opinion, it's, it's not an either or scenario. It's too easy to say uh, globalization, deglobalization. It's, it's more nuanced than that. Firstly, even you know, if it's not going to China, it's going somewhere else. Uh, if it's going somewhere else, where? It could be India, but it could just be Mexico, right? To some extent, then there will be greater regionalization. So, you know, Europe. And, and there's, there's already evidence of that, that most of Europe's uh, business activities happen within Europe. And, and Asia's in the, you know, uh, 50 years ago, well, 30 years ago, it was 20% intra-Asia, now it's 60% intra-Asia. So essentially you've got this US MCA, Europe and Asia buyer. So instead of offshoring, originally it was outsourcing domestic living, offshoring, 
and now it's now the term is re or near shoring you know coming if not coming home then coming close by the other issue is whether it's re-globalization or de-globalization and what do i mean by that so if you take multinational firms you know for a long time they've had this dilemma do i go do i adapt to locally to countries where you invest or do i go for global efficiency and with global value chains clearly it was all about global efficiency but now there's an additional factor that's come in it's not about local responsiveness in uh, host economies what what about domestic responsiveness in home economies how do i include that as an additional factor other issue is when you say globalize globalize what I believe globalization of ideas, knowledge, intellectual capital, this is going to remain global. It's the production that becomes more regional. So one needs to look at, not in a sense of globalize, global or not global, or globalize or, or don't globalize, but what exactly are you talking about? Similarly, with production, if it starts coming home or nearby, you're talking about less globalization of blue collar jobs. But in a sense, with uh, video conferencing, for example, for Zoom, uh, what COVID has shown is a lot of work can be done from home. But if it can be done from home, it doesn't need to be done from home in the United States. It can be done from home in, in India at one third the price. So in the same way as you went blue collar shopping, you can go white collar shopping, which I suspect will happen uh, more and more. The final issue is what kind of product are you talking about? I mean, it's highly unlikely that unless the consumers are willing to pay 10 times the price, the t-shirts are going to become local. T-shirts might remain global, but strategic goods, now it's, it's subjective what's a strategic good. Are masks a strategic good? Definitely ventilators are a strategic good, but there are many other strategic goods. One will want to localize those chairs. Final issue is this issue of data. So data is the new oil, data is the new uh, asset with maximum value and so on and so forth. Data is global. How do you handle glo globalization of data? And where do the new titans fit in? I leave that as an open question. Because when you talk about the new titans, I'm talking about the Facebooks of the world. Uh, so, you know, when, when things go around on Facebook, where are the boundaries? Where are the borders? What's global? What's not global? It's a little uh, tricky and I think uh, we still have to come to terms with it. I think my final slide uh, is talking about, you know, globalization and its discontents. There is a dark side of globalization. And quite clearly, the financial crisis, uh, COVID and so on, uh, it's kind of showing or unsurfacing this darker side. That's why I put the term, the end of hyper-globalization. The question becomes, and I've put it as food for thought, what have we learned? And where do we go from here? The question is, do we want to go back to the way we were? What kind of globalization do we want post COVID? Do we want to go back to the way we were or is it time for a more fundamental re rethink? What kind of world do we want? And that uh, leads to my next point, which is what would a more sensible globalization look like? Up till now, globalization has meant globalization of the economy economic globalization, financial globalization. Well, what about public health? At the end of the day, if a virus shows that we are all one, then who funds uh, the search for solutions? When we find a solution, how is it distributed? Is it distributed equally to the entire world or are there wars being fought over uh, where it should go? And so on. Similar issue with climate change. Do we, so we want, do we want the next uh, stage of globalization to factor in incorporate these kinds of issues also. I mean, that's a challenge for all of us, but it deserves, uh, I guess, deserves more considered thought. The last point is, you know, if not hyper globalization, we're not throwing out globalization. That's like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. It's reaching for the middle ground towards a more delicate balance between global rules, norms, and greater diversity. What I mean here is, why did people want global rules? Well, if everyone converges to the same set of rules, it's more efficient. There are fewer transaction costs. On the other hand, uh, it limits 
the autonomy of nations, it kind of takes away from their identity and so on. So they have a legitimate reason to uh, resist it within limits. Uh, so how do we find that balance? And one could argue, as, as, as a general statement, also the same argument has been made, that greater diversity is good. It makes it more robust. So if you get give more policy space to different countries so that they can adapt to the different circumstances, they don't have to go abide by the exact demands of the Washington consensus and so and so forth. And these are things that I guess policymakers will have to, uh, to figure out. And on that point, uh, my final remark is back to the future. The pendulum will shift again. And what I mean by that is, you know, that arc of globalization has been more global, less global. It runs its course. It goes back in a, but it never goes, it's not an exact pendulum because it doesn't go back to the exact point where it swung to the opposite side. It finds, it finds a, a, a different swing. Thank you for uh, listening and uh, we'll take questions after. So there are two questions. One is from Neha Prasad and another from Vith Sharma. But uh, the basic thrust is, do you think there will be a lot of, uh, there is and will be a lot of anti-China rhetoric globally, driven partly by the US presidential election? Well, the key word there is globally. There, there will be anti-China rhetoric. I mean, that's quite obvious. It's happening right now. But there's a large world that's not United States. And this large world that's not united, well, that's not the West. Let's use that term for a moment. Uh, and that large world is partially sympathetic to China uh, for various reasons. And this is where the political economy comes in. Because, you know, for example, the PRI initiative is uh, spreading its tentacles towards all of Central Asia, parts of Africa, and more and more countries. And these countries become more beholden to China. Uh, China has moved in quickly into the space vacated by United States in Africa, Latin America, and other countries. So China has a lot more voice, and uh, and people are resisting United States in world fora because of the Chinese influence. So I, I think when we talk about anti-Chinese rhetoric, it's only from a but not only, but primarily from a North American perspective and we sit over here and we are shaped by that perspective uh, far more than maybe if you were sitting in some other continent. So there's a question from Radhika Sangha. Uh, she asks, uh, in your opinion, do you think the economy is again taking importance away from state and society? We are seeing countries open up their economies again despite the threat of virus still being large. Well, first, hi to Radhika. I remember her from my, from my class of a few years ago. Uh, look, I, economy needs to take importance. Question is the timing. One, one cannot be closing down economies uh, for a year. So the, the countries will open up. It's very, uh, it's very difficult question to answer. With each country is sitting different set of circumstances. They'll be opening up at different points of time, different things. And every, everyone's experimenting because no one knows. So this kind of opening up is different from the world economy opening up. You're taking it economy by economy and even sub-economy by sub-economy, right? So BC might be opening up differently to Ontario. And so there's no, there's no direct answer to that question. It's just a question of uh, respecting local there's facts on the ground. Well, there's a question from Paulina Franco. Uh, she asked, the biggest problems facing humanity are global in nature, COVID pandemic, climate change, income equality, and poverty. How do you think deglobalization will impact our ability to address these problems? <laughs> That's a very good question. And I guess I will, I will partly go back to my final slide, where I said, we need to think about what kind of globalization do we want. The fact is when you have this so-called hyper-globalization or the Washington consensus, uh, it's not its course. It's, it's quite obvious. And this is the same thing that happened 120 years ago. At that time of well, 100 plus years ago, there was a time when it was more global than today. But again, the wealth was sucked up by a few players. 
and you had the great titans of uh, of those years you know the carnegies and so on they left their mark but at the end of the day wealth accumulated so much in um, into so, such few hands that there was a backlash against it and eventually that led you know among other things to the depression this the, so you can see we've come a few a, a full circle and clearly uh you know the pendulum shifts we've all become aware that too many people are being left behind and if you don't have and, and you know what's happening let's take down south the if such a large segment of society has been left behind there's no consumptive capacity right uh which 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 limits the economy also but but here's another issue what ha- what happens with just shareholder capitalism that runs riot is you 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 can argue that we are told save money for a rainy day right if if times are bad you you have something to help you through so have a rainy day fund and what happens the moment covid happens uh some of these companies will go running to the government saying look bail us out otherwise too many people will lose jobs but what about the fantastic profits they made in the last 10 years uh, essentially most of it didn't go to any didn't they fund it went into shareholder buybacks didn't go into reinvestment for productivity went into shareholder buybacks and so is again the top 1% uh, uh, enriching itself and I, i think i think people have a sink through it in spite of the rhetoric and there's enough push back now that uh, and so it's not going to happen overnight which is why i said the pendulum is swinging this is like a large ship it doesn't turn a dime uh, it takes time and but and we'll, i think we'll see the tendency of it going in the other direction so the next question is related to your answer uh, here uh, this is from larry whatmore uh, he asks uh, we have built a consumption model predicated on the provision of cheap goods companies may want to manage supply chain risk but the short term earnings imperative will work against the su- supply chain redundancy how will institutional investors be persuaded that short term profitability should be compromised <laughs> how will they be persuaded partly by seeing what's happening right now partly this is going to be through conversations this is going to be conversations uh, amongst themselves you know so the business round table in the united states for example the uh, 20 of the of the leading firms recently put out a compact that they should be moving more towards stakeholders that the question is is it all you know they use the term greenwash uh is just whitewash before our eyes or do they really mean it that we don't know uh but i think to the extent that we live in democracies and we are becoming becoming more aware of the darker side of globalization i think basically is going to be us people as uh, citizens who are going to start uh shaping things in that direction if the if the well, arguably in an electoral democracy they should respond so this is not this is this is not uh, this is not china but it doesn't happen again over one year this will take time So I want to insert a question of my own, uh, and uh, it's related to the political aspect. Has COVID-19 given a free rein to the populist slash nationalist governments around the world? Absolutely. Naomi Klein had this book a few years ago called The Shock Doctrine, and essentially her argument was, whenever there's a, a shock or a seismic event, as I called it, uh, governments often take advantage of that. uh to promote the agenda now you can look at it as an opportunity as a positive opportunity and a negative opportunity i mean in a positive sense or a negative sense in a in a positive in a positive sense you can reshape society in a negative sense well basically you can become a dictator that's happening in hungary uh it's happening in poland it's happening in many other countries it is happening in uh to different degrees you know whether it's in india with the bjp uh it's happening that you know there's a question from jose pla babel uh 
how uh, how does deglobalization affect the strategies of digital platforms yeah so that's one where i to be honest i don't have any answer in that uh, when i talked at the end about data a lot of these platforms the digital platforms uh, data is very central to these platforms and data by by nature by definition one click and it's gone global and i don't think their business models uh, that understand the forces so well because all this is relatively speaking so new so you know in academia they are still struggling with it governments are struggling with it i think because it's stuff that's happening in real time the regulations are not in place uh, I, I don't have any answer to that one. Okay. There are a few questions uh, regarding uh, the impact of, of, of COVID on other developing economies, which is the non-China ones. Uh, so the question <coughs> asked Damji is, how will the developing nations fare once the pandemic settles, especially with respect to globalization? You see, when you say developing nations, mm, technically China is a developing nation. Right, and technically, the Congo is a developing nation. So it's very, it's very difficult to talk about developing nations in uh, as a as a category. But let's put it this way: there are some nations that have better state capacity than others. So if you, um, China clearly has a you know a very high state capacity. the congo has a very low state capacity india has a pretty good state capacity and and, and so on the i i think the many of the nations of africa don't have and we are we are not even talking about latin america uh they don't have the capacity they're going to become more dependent on other nations and when you say dependent on other nations the question becomes again do we come together as a world to help them out or do we vacate that space and if you vacate that space someone else is going to fill that space if that someone else is going to be china then legitimately china will have uh, more voice in 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 their world but also when uh, when there will be a reshaping of global institutions when there's a reshaping of global institutions and china has the backing of more and more uh, countries uh i think that collectively just means that tomorrow's world is going to be very different from today's there's a question from douglas kennedy if economic slash financial concerns are not going to retain primacy and production becomes more local won't the penalties in terms of price and productivity hurt society in a consumer society firms like walmart and its global supply chains have proved a benefit to lower income consumers can you change the globalization without a parallel shift in society's priorities good question so we are not saying that if it's not in china it will be in united states what one is saying and that's where it becomes regionalization is some of it might go to vietnam some of it might go to mexico depends on what it is also right uh it it may depending on the product yes will pay a price okay but to the extent that we are responsive to stakeholders we are already talking about the employees of walmart or uh, metro or loblaws or whatever uh, should be de deserve a better wage uh, if we start becoming responsive to stakeholders in society then if the price of some good goes up a little bit and the minimum wage goes up to 15 dollars an hour from 11 <clears throat> that partly compensates for it but of course we're going to be seeing a little recalibration of these kinds of things the other issue is uh you know many of us we uh we don't put our money where our mouth is so you know you might say that you want something to come back home but if the t-shirt costs 10 bucks instead of 6 bucks you don't buy the t-shirt so on some to some extent we also have to become more cognizant of of this tendency of ours there are a few questions on uh, the role of global institutions on globalization so there is one from tamia mera uh, who states that there is a, uh, a lot of criticism on how the who and uh, un are handling covid-19 
what role will these and similar institutions have in the future? Yeah, that's a important question. You know, to some extent, let's take the WTO, for example. The WTO has lost its voice, has lost its voice because the United States wants it to lose its voice at this point of time. But if you take WTO, its precursor was the GATT. GATT, GATT was a negotiating forum. GATT did not have uh, uh, punitive measures. WTO has punitive measures. Because it has punitive measures, there's more resistance. What may be part of the problem with WTO is now with the emergence of, of China and tomorrow someone else and so on and so forth. If something is not acceptable because it's too punitive and doesn't respect the facts on the ground in various other economies, uh, there's resistance. So it's like saying maybe uh, it should go back to being a negotiated forum. I, do, I don't know. But it's, it's like they're finding new solutions because current institutions are failing. With WHO, the problem is it has no autonomy, right? Uh, essentially, it can say what it wants, but countries will do what they want. Uh, it is beholden to its funders. So part of the issue remains the biggest funder is the United States for most of these institutions. And therefore, they want to have things their way. But increasingly, countries resist that. So essentially, if that means rejigging funding, then in the future, the funding will be different and there'll be more voices out there. Global governance has to evolve because we are not living in 1945 anymore when most of these institutions are formed. So there's a provocative question from Ziva Shinar uh, and probably asking your opinion. Uh, are you predicting an economic colonialism again? In one sense, I think what may happen is an extension of what has happened. And uh, what do I mean by that? So you, you think about it, the, the it's the West, the rich West. They, in 45, they were young, they were hungry. Then they became old or older, a uh, little fat, maybe didn't want to work so hard. Uh, with the money they had, they decided, you know what, let's enjoy life rather than uh, invest in more productive investments, make more money out of more money, and so on and so forth. And how do they do that? They said, let's send it all off to China or Bangladesh or Vietnam and let them do the dirty work and we'll enjoy life. And let's say that comes to an end now. Well, I shouldn't say an end. Uh, it has reached its limits. Well, with technology as the great enabler, white collar jobs can just repeat what happened to blue collar jobs. So you don't go to Bangladesh, you go to India. And if everything can be done on Zoom, let it be done on Zoom. Or, or whichever other platform you want to use. And so effectively you're doing body, you're doing body shopping in a certain sense. <clears throat> As part of multinational or outsourced or offshore or, or whatever it might be. And to the extent that you can mine it for all it's worth, it gives the old model uh, some more time. Okay, how much more time? I don't know. Having said that, I think it's pure hyper-globalization with just about the shareholders, which typically are not you and me, it's the institutional capital. I think that has uh, run its course. And I don't, I'm not saying it will disappear. I'm just saying the trajectory is an inflection point. Uh, so there's a question on um, uh, developing countries again, uh, and it relates to that if uh, you know there are, there's kind of a continuing fight between big powers, we have deglobalization, then should uh, smaller countries, especially in Africa, rethink regional, regionalization as a viable option? Well, you know, Africa is so fragmented. I mean, they've got regional institutions within Africa, like Southern African Development Cooperation and so on. But these are, these are non-functional. For various historic reasons, 
many of these groupings have not performed. So you have the Africa Union, but Africa is a complicated country. The, they recently decided not to create a replica of the EU, but to remove all barriers to trade within Africa. I mean, that's a, that's a big thing for Africa. Demographically, Africa is going to be 2 billion people uh, in, the, in the foreseeable future. Uh, you know, Africa's got potential, but right now on their own, there are too many, uh, most of them with relatively small populations. I think when you're a, a small power, well, the two issues, one is you become a conglomeration of small powers. And is that enough? Or are you better off riding on the coattails of larger powers? And when you say larger powers, at the moment, there are three. There's United States, there's EU, and there's China. And EU, at the moment, is too absorbed in its own issues of fragmentation, nationalism, populism, trying to hold the EU together. Uh, its voice in the, over the last 30 years has, has shrunk in, uh, I'm talking at the, at the global level. So then you're saying mostly it's, it's China or, or United States. So there's your bipolar world. And these two have two different types of governance. And I'm not going to say that China is not capitalist. China is more capitalist than the United States. In, in many ways, but it is state-led capitalism rather than, and, and you can even use the term authoritarian or party-led capitalism in contrast to what we call liberal <clears throat> capitalism. So there are two different models and uh, state-led capitalism has many advantages over liberal capitalism and China loves promoting those advantages as and when it can. And that's very attractive to strong men uh, governed countries, which often are countries where institutions are weak, which are the small powers like Africa and so on and so forth. So in the past, they might have leaned towards America. Well, the West was in the past Europe or America. Now, if you discount Europe a little bit, you've got America. But not everyone wants to be over-dependent on, on, uh, on one power. So in one sense, they've got options now which you didn't have earlier. Uh, so this is the last question, uh, and um, if we think of globalization as movement of capital, products, and people, does COVID-19 differentially impact each of these mobilities? So that's a good one. So you go back to uh, the last period of hyper-globalization. You had globalization of uh, finance products and people. There was full labor mobility. Over the last uh, well, few, last few decades of hyper-globalization, one thing that hasn't been there is mobility of labor or human globalization. Uh, some countries don't want them. Other countries want only certain kinds and so on, but there are too many restrictions. The reality is whether you like it or not, there is going to be, uh, I won't call the word globalization of people, but large scale human movements of people. If there's a climate crisis, a lot of African countries, they live on the margins, <clears throat> climatically. If there's a COVID crisis, a lot of African countries are <clears throat> uh, not capable of, uh, they, don't have the, they don't have the infrastructure. Where will they go? Well, they go to Europe. If you start talking North America, if there's a, I, Ecuador was devastated. Uh, there's a lot of talk about some of the Central American countries being devastated. Uh, you know, the, the information is, doesn't come out so easily. Well, if they have problems, where will they go? Right? They'll end up coming to your doors. Now, you, you can't shoot them. At the end of the day, people always go from more troubled places to less troubled places from poorer places to richer places. That's how people said in America. I mean, that's just an ongoing tendency, but the problem is now you have nationalism. And, and I wouldn't use the word nationalism, I use the word populism. Because nationalism is something different. Nationalism is between nation states. At the moment, the problem in the United States 
is it's two nations within United States fighting one another. Okay, that's not the true, uh, true definition of nationalism. But with populism, uh, yeah, these two, these movements of people and populism start coming head to head. And uh, it's an open question uh, how that's going to play out. Well, we'll end it here. Thanks, Anup, uh, on behalf of all uh, the people on the webinar. That was really a great presentation and thought provoking. Bringing to your attention what our uh, next uh, seminar, web semi uh, webinar would be, that is on Thursday, where uh, Professor Matthias Kipping will be talking about the role of history uh, in, uh, uh, in understanding uh, the post pandemic uh, world. And, um, uh, and also, I want to reiterate that uh, Shulik uh, continues to be open, and uh, we have people willing to answer your questions regarding the webinar series or about admissions, about our different programs. So with that, I'll uh, uh, finish up the webinar and thanks uh, to all to, uh, for joining us and hope to see you all on, on Thursday.